following sermon is rated PG due to mature subject matter. Welcome to week two of a series we've been in called Bad Dating. Three things most of us are doing wrong. We talked about the first one last weekend, and if you missed that message, you can always get previous messages on our website. It's experiencelifenow.com. But I got an email this week that I think kind of sums it up. I want to share it with you. The guy sent me this. He said, hey, Chris, when I first heard the title of the new series, my first thought was, how is this going to pertain to my wife and I since we've been married 11 years? Like we're not single. After listening, you basically summed up my entire adult life. I'm currently on my third marriage. In addition to my two failed marriages, I have a life littered with failed relationships. The reasoning was exactly what you said, as I did not have Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was looking to my spouse and significant others for happiness and joy. Even though this was totally and a totally unrealistic expectation, I figured the relationship was a failure and went on to the next one. You may ask why my current marriage is any different. Well, the difference is that we have both truly accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and He and He alone is our source of joy. Oh, we are both very happy with each other. However, we don't look to the other for joy. We know that Jesus alone can give that to us. If I would have heard this years ago, I could have spared so much heartache for others. Would you help me thank him for letting me share that story? (laughs) That basically uh, sums up last weekend. Again, you can check it out online if you missed it. This weekend, a second thing many of us are doing wrong. If you have a Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to continue listening to Paul. You pull out a Bible or I'll have the verses up here on the screen. But if you remember from last weekend, a church wrote Paul a letter asking him some questions about marriage, about dating, what we would call dating. And he answered them. One of the questions about dating was there were some single guys, single girls in the church, had a boyfriend or girlfriend, wanted to get married, and they wanted to know what Paul thought about it. So they said, hey, Paul, you think these guys should get married? And he answers in this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's keep going. Verse 36, Paul says, but, we gotta stop there, because that's a big but right there. Okay, right there we gotta stop and talk about it. He was talking about previously how great it is to be single. He's like, you can be happy as a single. We're like, are you sure, Paul? He's like, yeah, you can be happy. You can be content as a single, but he recognizes not everybody has that gift. Not everybody's called, and it's a gift, it's a calling, Everybody's called to be single for the rest of their lives. He understands that. So he's saying, hey, that's a good thing. It's a good calling, but he keeps going. <clears throat> if a man thinks that he's treating his fiance improperly and he will inevitably give in to his passion, now stop there. So he's saying, if there's a guy in the church, okay, he's dating a girl and he's thinking maybe he's going too far or it's a fiance, maybe they're engaged, but it's like pre-marriage here, okay? He's like, if you think he's going too far with his girlfriend and he's going to give in to his passion, you know what he's implying here, right? Like he's dying to have sex with his girlfriend, okay? That's what he's saying. Like he wants to get it on with her like Donkey Kong, okay? That's what he's saying. He wants to get jiggy with it in the bedroom, all right? That's what he's saying right here. That's what that means. He wants to give in to his passion. He's fixing to tell them what they should do. You're like, is this church? This church, okay? We're talking about this. Now, Before I tell you what Paul said, how would culture answer this question? Two people are dating, and they're in love, and they want to get it on like Donkey Kong. What does culture say? Go for it. No shame in that game. Got to try things out. Got to see if things work. Why don't you just go for it? It's going to be fantastic. Just get it on. That's what culture would say, right? That's what your friends, many of your friends might say. How many of you guys have seen the show or follow the series, 
parenthood on TV? Okay, quite a few of you. Well, I can illustrate this point through this show. Two people in this show. Drew, the nephew of Uncle Crosby. This is Crosby, his nephew, Drew. Drew's in college, okay, during this one episode. And Drew likes this girl, and so they're sleeping together. The problem is, the girl he's sleeping with wants to go to frat parties and sleep with other guys. So Drew doesn't think that's right. He thinks she should just sleep with him. So he goes to Uncle Crosby, <clears throat> and he says, hey, uh, Uncle Crosby, um, like, I think maybe we should be exclusive, and she's wanting to sleep around. What do you think about that, Uncle Crosby? And Uncle Crosby's like, Drew, here's the thing. Drew, it's college, bro. That's what you do in college. So here's what you do. You let her sleep around, and you go sleep around too. Go to some, some sorority parties or whatever. You can sleep with her, and then sleep with a bunch of other girls too. It's cool, Drew. It's cool. It's college, Drew. That's what you do in college. You gotta try things out. That's culture. <clears throat> you know this, right? You see it on TV. You see it on the internet. Two people want to get it on. Go for it. No parameters, no rules, go for it. So here's what you gotta decide. You can listen to parenthood, or you can listen to Paul. We've already established Paul is credible. We should listen to him when he talks about dating because he's clearly been sent by God to talk to us about this. So what does Paul say that a couple should do? If they're really wanting to have sex, they're wanting to get it on, what does he say they should do? It's Paul. It's the opposite of parenthood. He says, let him marry her as he wishes. It's not a sin. In other words, put a ring on it. Have him put a ring on it. Get her some hardware. Set up a wedding ceremony. Say, I do, I do, and then get it on as much as you want to get it on. You're like, is that in the Bible? He didn't say it's bad that the guy was gonna give it to his passion. He just said, get married first, then do it. All you want to do it. That's in the Bible. Now some of you, you're surprised because your parents told you God was against sex, didn't they? They said, God doesn't like it. He covers his eyes when people do it. <laughs> he tells them to get under the covers and get a room. I mean, he's like, I ain't watching that, that's gross. That's what your parents told you, right? Here, let me tell you. Your parents don't really think. God's against sex. Didn't you ever as a kid accidentally walk in <laughs> late at night <laughs> on accident? You're like, I'm trying to forget. <laughs> and things start getting thrown around. You remember this? It's chunking stuff, covering things up. Get out of here, Johnny. You're like, Mom, Dad, what are y'all doing? They're like, we're just having a conversation. <laughs> and you remember what you said? Looks more like a wrestling match than a conversation to me. Oh my gosh. That's a crazy conversation. <laughs> Sex is God's idea. And then your parents' idea. Your parents didn't invent it, okay? They were messing around one day like, Good God, look what we just invented. The baby just popped out. That's amazing. <laughs> Some of your dads may claim this. He's like, I'm a love machine. No, he's not. <laughs> Some of you are like, this is way too much information, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to forget, Chris, you're reminding me of stuff. Hurt me, scarred me. Anyways, God created it. <clears throat> he designed sex. He likes it, I want you to have it. In the context he designed it for though, which is marriage. He says it gets outside of marriage, people start getting hurt. That's why Paul said, if you're dying to do it, that's good, that's fine. Put a ring on it, get married and have a lot of fun. This is the second thing most people that are dating are getting wrong. If you're taking notes. <clears throat> you're dating so you can get it on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> you can write that down, Donkey Kong. Okay, yes way. Because you're thinking, hey, if we go FBO, you know that, right? F Facebook official. <laughs> if I'm in a dating relationship, then we have sex. Because we love each other. We're FBO, all right? That, that's permission, that's the rule. That's a bad reason to date. You don't date so you can have sex. Paul says, you put a ring on, that's what you want to do. Here are some reasons why this is a bad reason to date. Number one, in chapter six, we've been in chapter seven, but in chapter six, Paul lists out a number of sins against God and he lists this one first. 
is a crime against God. Sex outside of marriage. I'll show, I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning verse 9. Don't fool yourselves, because it's easy to fool ourselves. Think we're right when we're not in this area. Those who indulge in what? <laughs> Sexual sin. You know what he's talking about? Premarital sex. He's talking about sex outside of marriage. It's kind of a, this is broad, but it includes that. Or who worship idols, or who commit adultery. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying it's a crime against God. One of the reasons it's a bad reason today is it's a crime. It hurts God. It hurts your loving Heavenly Father. And when you commit crimes against God, there's consequences. Even if Jesus saves you and has forgiven you, He doesn't always take away the temporal consequences. He takes away the eternal consequences, but not always the temporal consequences. We get hurt. First of all, God gets hurt. That's not His best for you or for me. Second, reasons, the bad reason to date. Paul says, no other sin affects you like this one does. Like it's in its own category in terms of how it hurts people. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. It's so bad, Paul says, run from it. Run from sexual sin. Don't walk, don't jog, don't skip. Get the heck out of there. Run. Why? No other sin, so he's putting it in his own category, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Now, if you've been there, done that, you could preach this sermon. You know this is true. It affects you at your core. You give something away. You can't get back. He's saying, no other sin, it, it, it doesn't affect you like this one does. This one hurts badly. So here's what you gotta remember. People forget this, so I say it all the time, just hoping you're gonna remember this. God isn't trying to keep you from having fun. He's trying to protect you from getting hurt. That's what a lot of times we think. Oh, he says I can't have sex, oh, man, outside of marriage, that stings. I wanted to have sex with a whole bunch of people, and now he won't let me. I can't even believe that. God's just trying to keep me from having fun. No, he's not. He's a loving heavenly father. He doesn't want you to screw up your life. Don't despise him for that. Isn't that what you want a loving heavenly father to do? Keep you from messing up your life? Yeah. So he's not trying to keep you from having fun. He knows no other sin affects you like this one does. It hurts outside of marriage. Because sex is meant to be an adhesive, not just a pleasurable experience, but an adhesive that joins two people together for the rest of their life. And what God joins together, let no man separate. It's a joining thing too, not just a pleasurable thing. So when you're joined to a bunch of people, it, it's, it hurts. Because you give things away to a whole bunch of people you can't get it back from to be able to give to the one that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Third. Tons of other people will get hurt. Third reason is a bad reason to date. Other people get hurt. You're like, who? Show you. God, we already said that. You and them, no other sin affects you like that one. Some other people, your future spouse, their future spouse. You think your future spouse wants you sleeping with somebody else right now? You think that's gonna be a difficult conversation? When you talk to them, have to tell them all the people you slept with, I guarantee it will be. They wanted you to save it for them. And you didn't. That hurts other people, not just you, the person you had sex with. Your future kids, their future kids, because if there's problems in a marriage, it hurts your kids. Your kids might justify their own actions because, oh, mom and dad did it. So it can hurt them. It can hurt your family and friends, their family and friends, because when you hurt, your family hurts for you. Your friends hurt for you, and sometimes they follow your example. Even when it's a bad one, they get hurt. He isn't trying to keep us from having fun. He's trying to protect you from hurting yourself and a whole bunch of other people. 
So you've got to decide. Who are you going to believe? Paul or parenthood? One of them is lying to you. I'll let you guess which one. Now, just to give you some hope that this is even possible, I'll tell you a story. I um, started dating Emily when I was 21 years old, and my wife, if you haven't seen her, she is gorgeous, okay? She is amazing. It wasn't long after dating her, I want to get on with her like Donkey Kong, okay? <laughs> I ain't even lying. But we were able to resist, her and I, uh, the temptation to do what we knew we weren't supposed to do. And uh, God showed us a way out of the temptation, and we were able to uh, wait to do that until we got married. So she was a virgin when we got married, and I was a virgin when we got married, and we're very thankful for that. We recognize that's not very common these days. Now, now some of you are like, well, I know how you made it, preacher, because you're a preacher. You're a holy man. I'm a dude first, okay? <laughs> That means I'm tempted in the same way other dudes are, okay? And we had to resist that temptation. And I'll tell you kind of how it worked for us. And maybe this will help you, even if you've already messed up from this day forward. Maybe this will help you. A couple of things had to happen in our hearts and in our minds for this to work. Number one, we realized, Emily and I, when we were dating, we weren't smarter than God. You know, when you do sex your way, rather than God's way, you know what you're saying, basically? You don't say it out loud, but you should. You're saying, God, I'm much smarter than you. I'm going to do it my way, not your way, because you're dumb, God. You're an idiot. Just say it out loud. Just tell him out loud. Because when you do sex your way rather than his, that's essentially what he's hearing you say. I don't trust you, God. I trust me. Because I'm smarter than you. And me and Emily just got to a point where we thought, we're not smarter than God. We're going to do it his way, not ours. Because we trust him. We know if we do it our way, we're going to get hurt. And second, we didn't want to spit in the face of the man who died in our place. And that's what sin is, right? Sexual sin or any other kind of sin. It's saying, Jesus, come here, come here, Jesus. And spit in his face. How could we treat our Savior like that? After all he did for us? How me and Emily were thinking, how could we do that to him? He gave his life for us and we're gonna spit in his face? Say, I'm doing it my way. I ain't listening to you. It's spitting in his face. Because of the gospel, what God had done for us, we just didn't want to spit in Jesus' face. So by the sheer grace of God and thinking those things, we were able to make it. And not that we weren't tempted, because we were. And then, on our wedding day, I got a new command to obey. Earlier in chapter seven, Paul says to married couples, do not deprive each other of sexual relations. So I determined on my wedding day, I was gonna have a perfect record of obedience to that one command <laughs> when I stood before God one day. That's why we got married at one in the afternoon, because I wasn't going to wait all day. <laughs> I guarantee you, driving from the wedding to the reception, I almost had that limo driver turn around. I was like, I got some business to take care of, okay? So, <laughs> I didn't care about the wedding, who was at the wedding. I was like, preacher, you better go short, dude, because I got to go somewhere, okay? <laughs> and then our wedding night, oh my, we got to move on, so can't talk about that, but <laughs> it's a trip to heaven and back. I'm just telling you, okay? And... We just decided Paul knows more in parenthood. We're gonna trust the Bible, what God said through Paul. And we're glad we did. We're thankful we did. Because sex is a gift, it's an awesome thing. God's not anti-sex, he's pro-sex. Just in the context he designed it for, which is marriage, starting on your wedding night, to celebrate between two people that are wanting to be joined together for the rest of their lives. It's a beautiful thing, it's a gift. God invented it, and it's definitely a gift. Now, some of you listen, and uh, this message hurts because you messed up. I'd say probably most people have. And uh, you wanted to wait. Maybe your parents told you, hey, it's better if you wait, and 
your youth pastor told you, and you didn't make it. I got good news for you today. I don't want you to leave down, depressed. Here's the good news. Jesus loves to give people fresh starts. Do you know that? He can give you a fresh start. And from this day forward, you can follow him. From this day forward, you can do sex God's way rather than yours. Here's how it works. Number one, you need to commit your life to Jesus if you haven't already. You need to become a follower of Jesus. He'll forgive all your sin. Make it as white as snow. If you turn from your sin, it's called repentance. And turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive my crimes. I'm a spiritual criminal. I know I am. And if I get what I deserve one day, it's going to be hell. I don't want that. Would you save me and forgive me? He always will. And if you've already committed your life to Christ, turn back. When you're living in sin, you've clearly turned away. Turn back and say, Jesus, let's do it your way this time. My way was terrible. I'm sorry, I thought I was smarter than you. Let's try it your way. I want to do it your way. So commit your life to Christ or start following him again. One and two, you need to apologize. If you want a fresh start, you need to apologize to the people you've hurt. Sex, your way rather than God's, it hurts people. You need to say you're sorry. The person you had sex with, to your friends and family you might have led astray, to your future spouse, don't lie about this. You're going to need to say, and you need to say it before you get married, here's my past. I'm so sorry. I didn't wait for you. I'm so sorry. I've given away something that I can't get back, and I can't give it to you fully. I'm sorry. To your kids one day, you need to have a conversation. Say, hey, don't do it my way. Son, daughter, I love you too much. I messed up. I'm sorry I set a bad example for you. I want God's best in your life even if for a while I wasn't experiencing God's best in mine. And when you start to apologize, you start to feel a weight lifted off your shoulders. And it kind of feels like you're getting a fresh start. Jesus wants to give you a fresh start. Turn to him. Get right with other people and watch him do something awesome in your life. So, don't date because you're dying to have sex. Get married first. Do it God's way because you're not smarter than God. Next weekend, third thing most of us are doing wrong. You're going to want to come back and you're going to want to bring some friends. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you that you give people fresh starts you forgive people when they mess up. I've messed up a ton in my life, God. Thank you that you've forgiven me because I committed my life to Jesus. God, I pray everybody listening to me now would make that decision if they haven't already. Say, Jesus, let's do it your way now. I give my life to you. And I pray, God, that you give people the confidence to approach people that they've hurt. Maybe a letter would be more appropriate. Maybe a phone call, whatever. Just say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I've hurt you. I'm a different person now. I'm going a different direction. Just wanted to say I'm sorry. God, give people the courage and confidence to do that. And then God, as they do, I pray that you give them the sense that they're getting a fresh start. Thanks for Jesus, his name. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.